Harrison Ingram just had his best college year on the biggest stage for a blue blood, and now he's got a big old decision to make. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Friday, April 5th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shea, joined by our guy, yes, on a Friday, Coach Pac Kilby, and you've joined us at The Place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch, and a big old special shout out to all you everydayers out there. Coming up on the show today, we've been seeing RJ Davis pop up in more and more NIL stuff. Hmm. Also, we want to talk more about Cade Tyson. I mentioned him last week, but we got some more confirmation on him this week that Carolina has indeed reached out. But, Pac, before we have all those conversations, I want to talk about Harrison Ingram. Earlier this week, I did a show where we looked at the R.J. Davis decision that he's got to make. Is he going to return for his fifth year? Is he going to go to the transfer? Not, oh, my gosh. No, not that. Not going to go to the transfer. Is he going to declare for the NBA draft? Anything like that. That's what we're looking at. And today, I want to have a similar conversation about Harrison Ingram. And and this conversation takes on a little bit of a different tenor pack because unlike RJ, Harrison does pop up here and there on some mock drafts. Um, And so we'll get to that side of it in a minute. But Pac, as you look at Harrison Ingram, he just had his best statistical year of his three years of college, despite the fact that he was not the featured player as he was at Stanford. So as you're looking at Harrison Ingram, and, and we want to talk about you know the factors that go into making this decision, is it a moment to strike while the uh, fire is hot? What do you think about his decision-making? Well, yeah, he's got a really a big decision ahead of him. And it's it's one of those things where it's like, you know, what you just mentioned too, do you strike while the iron is hot? Do you go on your best statistical year? Um, or do you, you know, do you do the thing where you kind of enter the draft, you see what they have to say about you, and then you come back and you improve on those things that the scouts were, um, you know, thinking were weaknesses? Or do you just say, hey, you know what, I'm coming back no matter what. And I'm going to ride this thing out with the Tar Heels and, and I'll let the rest of the, the stuff take care of itself down the line. So he could do any of those three. Um, for me personally, I think I, I like the idea of him, of him testing the waters with the draft and seeing, hey, you know, maybe I can go in the first round. And if not, this is what I've got to do to get to the first round next year. Let me come back to Carolina and get right. And ultimately, I'm just – my, my thought is that that's probably the route he's going to go. Um, but, but he's definitely got a big decision and a lot of options ahead of him. Yeah, Pac, if, and if I remember correctly, he tested after his freshman year at Stanford. Uh, but I think he would be wise to do so again now that he's shown himself with a different team as a complimentary piece. And I mean that in a very positive way to what this team did, showing all of the variety of things he, he is capable of. You know, you you and I have talked about a lot this year that Harrison Ingram is at is able to be the man when he doesn't have to be the man, and he's shown that. And I think there, I, I think he would be able to show that even more next year at Carolina. But Pack, a big part of this is that the 20 NBA draft is perceived, at the very least, to be a weaker draft than what we've had in recent years, and so not only the potential of strike while the iron's hot, but also if this can allow you to go higher this year, then you, you got to do what's right for your occupation in future, because there's only so many contracts you get in the NBA. And so it, if it's all there and all lines up and makes sense, while I want him back desperately in Chapel Hill, because I think it would be massive next year. I think that, he and RJ could have the type of relationship that he that RJ and Armando have had this year in leading the team. Um, I, I think that is RJ and and Harrison next year. But but Pac, man, I you know I, I've started looking more at the mock drafts 
um, just a couple numbers for you. At Tankathon, their latest, 52. NBADraft.net, 46. Draft Digest, 44. The Ringer, he's 39 in their most recent at ESPN, 34th. And Pack on Wednesday, I believe it was, Bleacher Report's most recent one came out from, uh, who does there's Jonathan Wasserman. Harrison Ingram, 27th, Pack. That's the first time I've seen him in a recent mock in the first round. And my dude, if he's going to get a first round guarantee, if he can find that from someone, I feel like he'd be dumb not to go. Is that, are you agree with that? A hundred percent. Yeah. If it, if it's a first round pick in the NBA draft, that's, that's a guaranteed contract. So um, you, you've got to take it because, you know, it's like you said, this is a weaker draft. Um, and then you never know if you come back, what kind of injuries you could get into. Maybe you just have a down year. It's a gamble. Uh, in a sense. So if you've got a first round lock, then you're right. You would be, you would be insane not to take that opportunity. And obviously we would want him to do that. We would support him in that. Um, Otherwise he's got a real decision in front of him. You know, it's like, God, because a lot of these are right there in the the low to mid thirties and even low forties. So it's like, do we, do we take that gamble, you know, to go to the NBA on a non non guaranteed contract, or do we come back, you know, get some pretty what I would imagine would be some pretty good NIL money from Carolina, and show out, get better, and then go maybe guarantee ourselves a, a first round draft pick or earlier draft pick the next year. So uh, it's definitely it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. And what you just said about the NIL possibilities, I think is a massive part of this conversation as it is with RJ, because we've seen this year, especially with TJ Beisner coming in from Kentucky to lead Carolina's NIL efforts through the secondary break club. I mean, Armando is just plastered all over the place and just, it's almost packed. Think about it this way. Remember how at the beginning of this season, we said part of the logic we put behind propping up RJ when he wasn't even voted to a preseason all ACC team was we said all those shots from Caleb got to go somewhere, right? And RJ is going to be the big beneficiary of him. Let me put it in a similar term. All that NIL money and whatever that Armando got is probably got to go somewhere. And you know what? Harrison Ingram, from a personality standpoint, he's gregarious. People want to be around him. I bet he's great in front of the camera. It just makes sense to me that if I'm a company, this is a good young man uh, who's reputable, who I think would do really well representing my company and who I would want, uh, you know, to be able to work with because he is easy to work with. That just makes a lot of sense. And I think he could rack up in NIL next season. So that's a big factor too. And then pack it all ultimately comes down to just like every other decision, what matters to him? From everything we understand about his family, they are not hurting for money, so he doesn't necessarily need to go to the NBA draft. And I guess that would make the same thing true about NIL. But still, you want to make a name for yourself, and I get that. But what matters to him, right? Like, we know that because he went to Stanford, we know because he came to Carolina and because he's talked about it, that education matters to not only him, but to his family. And so I think there is a world in which he would really value and, and it's rare that we talk about it this way, but would really value sticking around and going ahead and getting his degree. I think that is a big factor for Harrison Ingram in making this decision. That's a massive factor. Um, I obviously don't want to speak for him because we don't know, but that's right. Just the fact that you have for anyone that you could have a degree from a university that's as reputable as the university of North Carolina. That's a, that's a major value. And if he comes back, then that's going to give him that opportunity. And so uh, I I definitely it's funny that you mentioned it because I was about to mention the importance of it and uh, how that could factor into whether or not he comes back or not. Mm -hmm. And and I think it I think it will factor into it in in some way, shape or form. And, you know, the other thing to remember is his sister is at Duke. His family is in the area. So um, that's that's just another thing that that could potentially uh, keep him at Carolina and keep him home. And so, um, yeah, it's certainly a big decision, but man, I, I gotta say just a gut instinct. I, I feel good about him being in a Carolina uniform next year. Mm. Um, Pac, that is a great point about his sister. She was just a freshman, right? If I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I wouldn't hold me to it, but I think that's right. Yeah. 
And so in the same way that, that we've talked about, look, like when RJ is making his decision, Deja Kelly's making her decision. And that's a factor. I think the same is true of Harrison here and his sister. That's a great point. Ultimately I'm with you. I think he, sh he needs to, in my opinion, go test the NBA draft again, find out where he's at, what he's got to work on and what kind of guarantee he can get from a team. Cause he's the kind of guy that the right team with the right needs and the right fit, boy, I think he could be gangbusters. But again, it all boils down to what he wants to do. And I'll say the same thing I said about RJ. The earlier he makes the decision, the better it is for Carolina's um, ability to construct their roster in the best possible way for next season. So we're going to be watching out for that. Now, Pac, we've talked some about RJ. We've talked some about NIL. And we've noticed in the last couple of days that we are seeing more RJ Davis NIL things rolling out. Is that a sign? We'll try to answer that question coming up in just a few minutes. Right after I tell you about Robinhood, did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood, in fact, has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of quarter as of one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match, and you must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. We've just been talking about Harrison Ingram and the potential of him returning to North Carolina or going to the NBA draft, staying in, testing whatever he will do. By the way, while we were talking, looked it up, Lauren Ingram is in fact a freshman right now at Duke, so would just be a sophomore next season. But Pac, one of the things we've noticed this week, even following North Carolina being done for the season, is that RJ Davis's image has continued to pop up with uh, NIL things and endorsement things. And so one of the questions we want to ask, and or I, I guess that I've been being asked by a lot of people is, look, at this time of year, what are we all doing? We're looking for every nugget of indication we can to suggest a decision, a leaning. Oh, I saw RJ do this that he doesn't usually do. So does that mean he's leaving? Oh, RJ's tying his shoes different. So, you know, it's like just every little nugget of gold we can find that seems like it could be a, an indication. We want to make it a thing. So, Pac, that's what we're doing right now. The fact that we're still seeing RJ in commercials, in ads, and things like that, could that be some sort of a sign of what his intentions are for next season? Yeah, I, I think it can. Um, you know, these these deals that he are, that he's signing um, are made possible through the fact that he's a basketball player for the University of North Carolina and a really good one at that. And so I think, you know, to me, I think that's a pretty good indicator that he's going to come back. And, it, you know, it could be one of two things. I, I've thought about this, um, and me and you have talked about it a little bit just between ourselves, but maybe he's trying to make as much money as he can before he leaves. You know, that's that's one way to look at it. You know, glass half empty, if you will. Uh, I choose glass half full. I think he's signing these deals because he's likely going to be back in a Carolina uniform next year. And uh, he's going to take advantage of the brand that he's created for himself by being such a good player uh, at such a, a great historical program. And so to me, I do believe it's an indicator, um, but I also could see that you know, these these deals are endorsements, so they're not necessarily tied to the university. They're more so tied to the athlete. Um, so it doesn't mean he has to return because he's signing these. But I do think that his 
his brand and who he is is made larger by the fact that he is a Tar Heel. And to me, that would indicate heavily that he's probably going to be back. Hmm. I mean, and it's the kind of thing where at the least it can't be a bad sign. You know, there's nothing that's like, oh, this is this is clearly if there if there is anything to be to learn from this. It's not negative by any stretch of the imagination. And so, you know, you look at it and if there is something to be read into RJ's decision making, uh, this would at, at least suggest that there's a possibility of him returning. Um, Pac, but I think you make a good point there about, you know, it it being by nature uh, about him. And so that could go with him wherever he goes. Wouldn't have to be specifically a North Carolina thing. Um, you know, I talked about it earlier this week on the show, um, but I would love to hear some of your thoughts just about RJ's decision. I know we just talked about Harrison's um, and I've talked about RJ's, but I, I'm sure folks would love to hear your thoughts on RJ and his decision-making process. Well, it goes kind of back to what we were talking about with Harrison. You, you can go look at the mock drafts and you can find Harrison's name on there, but you don't find RJ's. And, uh, you know, I, I've always had a hard time with that. I find that crazy to believe because I think RJ is an, an amazing player. He could make an NBA player for somebody, I would think. But anyways, that's besides the point. He's not on the mock drafts. And, uh, and so, to me, that makes his decision a lot easier, you know, because when you look at it, okay, he's not going pro, at least to the NBA. Um, unless he signs, um, you know, a contract after the draft. Um, he's not going to most likely, I wouldn't think, go to the transfer portal because of the legacy he's built for himself at Carolina. He could only further establish that by, by coming back. Um, so to me, when I look at it and I break it down, um, I, think, I think Carolina is the, is the right choice for him. Um, he can come back. He can get another year's worth of, of NIL money. And it goes back to the Armando thing we talked about, you know, that NIL money has got to go somewhere. So why not have RJ capitalize Harrison capitalize Elliot Cadeau capitalize on that. Um, let those guys make what they can while they can. Um, and then he come in and, uh, or come back and just further cement his legacy, which is already an amazing one. You know, his, his Jersey, is already going to be up in the banners uh, or up in the rafters. But, you know, what he could accomplish, especially with what we potentially have coming back next year, could be something really special. And so I, I think he sees that. Um, I, I think that he he's probably well aware of the legacy he has on the line here at Carolina. And I think that might be enough of a motivator to get him back for one more season. Yeah. And, and similar to what you said earlier about Harrison, there are obviously no guarantees of – team or individual success next year, but I know Armando's gone, but if you have Elliot and if you have RJ and if you have Harrison, plus the other returners, who knows what, what you get out of the transfer portal. We'll talk some about that here in just a minute. I mean, there, there's a lot of potential you look at right there, Pac, um, yeah. that, that I to, like. To add to that, yeah. you know, I just want to piggyback off what you said. Listen, after year two of the Hubert Davis era, there's no guarantees. <laughs> you know, we thought we were going to win a national championship that year. Didn't even make the NCAA tournament. But you're right. What we would have coming back if he decides to return, you look at it and you got to think, well, man, that's that's going to be a pretty good group. But uh, I don't know how you guys are. I don't know how you are, Isaac, but I'm not taking anything from, for granted from now on. <laughs> I, 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 and, and part of it is, it's so hard to build a program in this day and age because of the transfer portal, right? Like it's almost just like free agency year after year where you've just got to construct a new roster just about every year. I mean, you might be able to keep some, some uh, foundational pieces, but man, every year it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. You know, there's just like Carolina was on paper last year projected to be so well. There were teams this year that on paper projected to be really good and weren't. There were teams on paper this year that I was like, I don't know. And then they've been awesome. And so I, I'm with you, Peck. There is no year to year like we're going to be fine. You, you just don't know until that product is on court and playing. And I think there is a lot of trepidation about that. But it's also kind of fun. Like, what are we going to be this year? Um, 
So it just makes it harder and harder to work with. So, uh, you know, Pac, we'll just have to see. But here's the one thing I will not be able to stand if RJ comes back is another year of Corey Alexander putting an asterisk on everything uh, because he's a fifth-year player like he did with Armando this year. So, oh, boy, I just got to buckle up for that if, if RJ is back. Now, Pac, speaking of the transfer portal, Last week, I talked about Cade Tyson, a Belmont transfer, and said I thought he would be a great addition for the Tar Heels. And great news, we got confirmation this week that Carolina has indeed reached out. So we'll talk about Cade Tyson, where he might fit, and what that might look like if Carolina is able to land this young man. Right after I tell you about game time, the Final Four is tomorrow in Phoenix. Well, look. We might have been planning to go, and you might want to get game time tickets if you live in the Phoenix area. But we're all bummed, and most of us are out on the tournament. So you know what you could do? Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even easier and faster. Prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. They've got killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee. With all of that, Game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets for MLB games. They've got one of my favorite features, last minute deals. Save up to 60% off by buying tickets last minute for sports, but also comedy, theater, concerts, and more. And honestly, I often worry when I buy third-party tickets about showing up and getting turned away because I bought bogus tickets. But with the game time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the entire ticketing industry. I love that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download their app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, gang, we want to talk about Cade Tyson, the transfer Tyson, the transfer from Belmont. Let me remind you, I did a show on uh, Monday of this, or maybe it was Tuesday of this week, I guess, where I just laid out where we're at right now from a scholarship count standpoint. As of right now, if everyone returns that cans and you bring in the freshmen and the three guys that are out of eligibility, Armando Baycott, Paxson Wojcik, and Cormac Ryan, You've got 11 scholarships utilized, meaning there are two remaining. Everyone gets 13. So as of right now, if the coaching staff wanted to, they can use at least two scholarships. Although I'll remind you, they chose to only use 11 on scholarship level players last year. It's just part of the way you do business in college basketball right now because you don't want a guy sitting at the end of your bench never playing and he might be dissatisfied and transfer. So we'll see how they want to utilize those. But right now, they do have two free and available. Obviously, if RJ decides to leave, that frees up another one. If Harrison decides to leave, that frees up another one. If anyone transfers out, that frees them up. So it's it's just all part of this cyclical thing we're all keeping our eyes on. But again, right now, we know that there are at least two scholarships open to be given out for the Tar Heels. So if you want to learn more about Cade Tyson and his game specifically, go check out the segment I did on him last week. Um, I even clipped it out as an individual segment, so you can just go find that on YouTube. But Pac, while I had speculated about it last week, we have found out this week officially that Carolina has contacted him, and it's multiple source, so you can take that to the bank from reputable sources. Inside Carolina mentioned it. Um, our guy R.L. Bynum from Tar Heel Tribune Um talked about it, confirmed from Cade Tyson's AAU coach that Carolina had reached out. Pack, that's enough for me, just like a newspaper or news organization would want to do. Two sources, you take it to the bank. So, Pack, where do you think, from what you've seen and heard and, and thought about Cade Tyson, the brother of former Clemson player Hunter Tyson, where do you think he would best fit on the roster, given what it looks like right now in terms of position and, and role? Well, I think he's a shoe-in replacement for Cormac. Um, and, and while he's not the same player necessarily as Cormac, he would be a great replacement because of the value he can bring in shooting the basketball. And and not only that, but he's got good size standing at six foot seven. I mean, that's that's just would be ideal for us. 
to provide a little bit more, more height, a little more length. And then, you know, you match that with the fact that he shoots the ball so well. I think he would just fit in really well um, sliding in at the small forward, replacing Cormac. Yeah, I mean, that that's the logical place to me. And that and that's where I talked about him sliding in. Um, and and I've interestingly, Pac, I've also been asked the question a couple times this week. If Harrison Ingram did leave, could Cade Tyson come and instead of playing the three, play the four? I, I have some reservations about that, but I'm curious your thoughts on it. I have a lot of reservations about it. You know, just – and I haven't sat down and just watched and watched sure. and watched Kerry sure. Tyson play, but I've watched him and, and I've watched enough to know um, the thing that makes Harrison so effective at the four, um, even though he's undersized, he's extremely strong. He's very physical. Um, he has a knack for rebounding. Um, and he and Harrison just brings such a toughness. Not that K doesn't, but it's not the way that Harrison does either. You know, he's not going to be that strong rock. Um, that that he could guard people, you know, even even though he's undersized, he's not going to bring that toughness and that strength like Harrison does. And so um, I think, and I think that would be us taking him out of his comfort zone. That's right. Kind of like him yeah, in a tough spot. Because yeah. we've and, all seen how badly that can go. Yeah. Haley Van Lith is a perfect example of it. You know, if you're looking for something relevant right now, that's uh, <laughs> transferring to LSU and just being totally out of whack. That's kind of what we would be we would be doing to K Tyson if we if we slotted him at the four, yeah. um, and so I, I think um, you know for for him to be comfortable and be playing his best basketball, it would be at the three, and that's not asking him to get out of that and and play a position that wouldn't put him in his best position to succeed and play to his strengths. Yeah. And, and he doesn't have the same size or girth as Harrison. He's a couple inches shorter and doesn't weigh as much. And so I, I just don't see him being able to hold his own in the ACC uh, in the same way that like part of why Harrison's able to do that. Part of why Draymond Green is able to do that, who we've compared him so much to, is even though being undersized, just has the body mass to push dudes around when necessary. And so Pac, I almost think about Cade Tyson's role, similar to what Cam Johnson did, like in 2018, where you've got um, Garrison Brooks at the five, Luke May at the four, um, and then you can have Cam Johnson at the three. And so, you know, based on the roster construction right now, if Carolina doesn't bring it, like if Harrison's gone and Carolina has to have somebody else at the four and they don't bring anybody in, I think you're looking at a Jalen Withers a Zayden Hyde, depending on his development, uh, depending on who and what Carolina gets in the transfer portal, maybe even Jay Wash at the four as, as he continues. Like, keep in mind, this will be just his second healthy offseason since he was a sophomore in high school. So, you know, we just don't know what Jay Wash's development will be this offseason. So I'm right with you. I love Cade Tyson. I think he would be a phenomenal addition to this team. But, Pac, the other question that I've been getting asked this week is – how dare we think about recruiting over Ian Jackson and Drake Powell? And I hear that, I do. But let's just keep in mind that while Ian Jackson is going to be a phenomenal and explosive athlete and be able to do a lot for Carolina next year, the way you win in college basketball right now is not to rely on freshmen as a main key source of your team. And so... With, with all due respect to those guys who I think are going to be critical parts of Carolina's team next year, I, I have no problem with bringing in someone else that I think could start at the three what, and the competition that that would engender at that position as well. Pat, give me your thoughts on that. Couldn't agree more. You know, I sat and listened to Jay Wright talk the other day and he was talking about Kentucky and he said, you know, these players for Kentucky, they're going to grow to be better NBA players than anybody Oakland has. But Oakland has veteran players. They have experience. They have guys that that have been playing basketball for literally some of them have been playing for four more years at this level than Kentucky's players. And when I look at that and how it fits to Carolina, it goes back to exactly what you just said. Ian, he's going to be amazing. He's going to be a pro. Drake, he's going to be amazing. He's going to be a pro. But we can succeed more as a team if we're not asking those guys to do too much with their roles. Because they're freshmen. Yeah. And because March is a really tough time to win, 
and you need age, you need experience, you need veteran play. And, and to me, that's what K. Tyson brings. But even if he comes and, and Ian or Drake or one of those guys beats him out for a spot, it's like you said, it's great competition. It makes everybody better. And, and we can still use Cade in a very significant role. Um, so I see it both sides, but I do tend to agree with you. Um, time and time again, it's been proven that freshmen are uh, fool's gold when it comes to March. Um, you, you cannot ask them to do too much. They have to have a role um, that they can play within your system, but you also have to have – you have to match that with veteran experience and talent, and I think Cade does give us that. Yeah. And, uh, like, it, it's cool for me in a way because it's a return to a mindset from years ago before teams started relying so heavily on freshmen where it's like almost the expectation now – that freshmen should come in and kind of wait their turn a little bit more unless they're otherworldly good. And, and I just, I don't think that's a bad thing for our game. That's the side of NIL that's been so great for college basketball in my estimation pack. And then the one other question we just have to keep in mind and consider that we always think about with mid-major players transferring up is if Cade Tyson comes, who by the way is from the Charlotte area, like the Southeast suburbs of Charlotte, does his ability where he was the second leading three point shooter in per- terms of percentage last year, does that translate up from Belmont to the ACC? I think so based on what I've seen, but it's never a guarantee. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Pat Kilby, great stuff as always fun conversations today. Looking at Harrison Ingram's decision, some hints from RJ, maybe, maybe not. We don't know yet, but we're, we're talking about it and boy, would we love Cade Tyson in the Argyle and Baby Blue. Let's make that happen, my friend. All right, gang, that's it for this week of Locked on Tar Heels. Great to have Pat Kilby with us on a Friday. How about that action final four this weekend? I'm curious if anybody's going to be watching. I will be. I'm kind of back to the place where I can watch basketball again. I'm ready for it. Give me UConn against Purdue on Monday night. I would love to see Zach Eady and Donovan Klingon go up against each other. If you're not part of the Locked uh, Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, come join us. We would love to have you in there. The link's in the show notes, free to join, come do it. Please subscribe to the show, audio and video. We'd love to have you there as well. Y'all, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again on Monday, but until then, peace.